Shalom Israel. Shalom to the Akayim. Kal Halalah, Yahweh Akai. We're going to start off today up in the uh, his book, The 13th Tribe by Arthur Koest. It's the uh, rise and the fall of the Khazars. All right, we're going to really jump right into it. You know, they exposing themselves. You know what I'm saying? This book. So, you know, we got to bring it out. All right. All right, check it out. This right here. This is Emperor Charlemagne. And it says, about the time when Charlemagne was crowned Emperor of the West, the eastern confines of Europe between the Caucasus and the Volga were ruled by the Jewish state known as the Khazar Empire. At the peak of its power from the 7th to the 10th centuries AD, it played a significant part in shaping the dynasties of medieval and consequently of modern Europe. Right? They say the Byzantine emperor and historian is, poor, is Constantine Porphyrogenitus, 913 through 959, must have been well must have been well aware of this when he recorded in his trustees on court protocol either letters addressed to the Pope in Rome and similarly those to the Emperor of the West, right? All right, and this right here, this will be Constantine Porphyrogenitus right here, right? All right, he the one that wrote letters to the Pope and similarly those to the Emperor of the West. Had a gold seal worth two, solidly attached to them, whereas Messages to the king of the Khazars display a seal worth three solid. All right. And remember, this was the king of the Khazars right here, Emperor Charlemagne. See, this was not flattery, but real politic. In the period which we were, we are concerned, Robbery, it is pro profitable that the king of the Khazars was of little less importance in view of the imperial foreign policy than Charles the Great and his successors, right? All right, this would be Charles the Great right here. All right. Let's say, the country of the Khazars, a people of Turkish stock. See, these are Turkish people right here. A people of Turkish stock occupy a strategic strategic position at a vital gateway between the Black Sea and the Caspian, where the great eastern powers of the period confronted each other. It acted as a buffer protecting Byzantine against invasions. And remember, this is the Byzantine Empire right here. So it acted as a buffer protecting the Byzantine against invasions by the lusty barbarian tribesmen of the north northern steppes. Right? Alright, and these is the barbarian armies right here. Alright, so this right here would be the Bulgars, right? Alright, these people right here would be the Magyars. Right? The Bulgars, the Maggars, and the Pekinegs. So these would be the Maggars, and these would be the Pekinegs, right? Better picture on them, right here. The Pekinegs. Alright? Etc. And later, the Vikings. Alright? The Vikings, right? Then you got the Russians, right? But equally, or even more important, both from the point of what, of both from the point of view of Byzantine diplomacy of the European history, as in fact the Khazar armies effectively blocked the Arab Arab avalanche in its most devastating 
devastating early stages and thus prevented the Muslim conquest of the Eastern Europe of Eastern Europe right check this out say the Khazar country lay across natural line in advance of Arabs within a few years of the death of Muhammad AD 632 the armies of the caliphate sweeping north through the through the wreckage of two empires carrying them all before them reached a great mountain barrier of the Caucasus alright this right here will be the caliphate armies right like the Muslims alright they was going across the land of the Caucasus right say uh Let's see, it say this barrier once passed, the road lay open to the lands of Eastern Europe. It was as it was on the line of the Caucasus, right? The Arabs met the forces of an organized military power, which effect effectively prevented them from extending their conquest in this direction. The wars of the Arabs and the Khazars. Alright, this would be the war of the Arabs and the Khazars, right? <clears throat> Which lasted more than a hundred years, though a little known. Have thus considerable historic, historical importance, right? The Franks and the Charles martyr on the field of tours turned a tide of Arab invasion. About that same time, the threat of Europe in the east was hardly less accurate. The victorious Muslims met. Say the victorious Muslims were met and held by the forces of the Khazar kingdom. It can scarcely be doubted that the. It can scarcely be doubted that, but. For the existence of the Khazar and the reign of the north of the Caucasus. The reign of the north of the Caucasus, the Caucasus Mountains, right? And Byzantine and Bulwark of Europe civilization in the east. We have found itself outflanked by the Arabs and history of Christendom and Islam might will have been very different from what we know. It is perhaps not surprising, given the circumstances that in seven thirty two after the surround after the resounding Khazar victory over the Arabs, the future Emperor Constantine V Alright, so this would be Constantine V married a Khazar princess a Khazarian princess right here Constantine V's wife right in due time their son became the emperor Leo alright hold on alright here you go Leo alright known as Leo the Khazar ironically the last battle in the war A.D. 737 ended in a Khazar defeat, but by the time the impetus of the, Moli, of the Muslim holy war was spent, the caliphate was rocked by internal decisions, and the Arab invaders retraced their steps across the Caucasus without having gained a permanent foothold in the north. Whereas the Khazar became more powerful than they, and had pre than they had previously previously been, a few years later, probably A.D. 740, the king and his court and the military ruling class embraced the Jewish faith. See, so it's showing you that when they gained power again, they embraced the Jewish faith. That right. So they embraced the Jewish faith and Judaism became the state religion of who? The Khazars. See? So 
after pretty much the fall and then they moved up in there. You know what I'm saying? And they embraced that face. They took power. It just told us that they took power. They took control, you know what I'm saying, of that area. You know what I'm saying? And then they embraced the faith of the Jews, the Israelites. All right? I mean, that's that's it's telling us exactly what it happened in like AD 740. Right? It's the king who was uh Charlemagne. This was the king. Alright, uh Shalak, Shalak, it was Leo, the emperor, it, it was Leo the son. It was Emperor Leo, known as the Cars of Heart. But say, no doubt, their contemporaries were as astonished, astonished, which means surprised, by this decision as modern scholars were when came across the evidence in Arab, Byzantine, Russia, and what? Hebrew sources because they took over our area, right? One of the most recent comments is to be found in the work by the Hungarian, the, the Hungarian historian, Dr. Anton Bartha, all right? And it also shows us that the Hungarian people was ruled over by the Khazarian people. Right, and the Khazarian people was like what uh, of a Turkish stock. Look, it said our investigators cannot go into problem pertaining to the history of ideas, so they cannot go into investigations on these people. Right, but we must call the reader's attention to the matter of the Khazar kingdom, religion, state religion. It was a Jewish faith which became a official religion of the ruling strategy of society. So they made what we believed in as Hebrews, you know, they made it a religion and they called themselves Jewish people and made it a Jewish faith, right? And they made it the official religion, right? of the ruling strategy of society. So they used it strategizing, right? They used religion as a strategy. Say, so needless to say, the acceptance of the Jewish faith as the religion, as the state religion of the non-Jewish people could be the subject of interesting speculations. See, speculations of a non-Jewish people, people that didn't come from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know what I'm saying? So it's straight up, you know what I'm saying? That's straight up showing you what's going on. It's showing you that these people was a non-Jewish people who adopted the faith of the Hebrews and they called themselves Jewish people and made it a Jewish faith and they use it to strategize against society. Boom, just like that. Simple. Look, they fought wars against the uh, barbarian tribesmen, the Bulgars and the Migrants, right? And the uh, uh, Pick Against or whatever, Pack Against, right? Then they fought against the Arabs. And it, they was doing this just to gain territory, you know what I'm saying, to get, to get that. Hebrew state. This is what it's about. They come and try to get over that state so they can deceive people, man. Uh, they marry the uh, uh, then they, they marry into each other. They like the same people. It's showing us, man, you know. But we're going to keep it moving. Yeah, that's why I'm showing images so everybody can get an idea of what these cats look like. You know, because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to piece it together for you physically so you can see, you know, and I'm going to give you this information that, you know what I'm saying, write out this book, 
you know what I'm saying, Arthur Coesler, you know, the rise and fall of the Khazars. That's what it's about. They exposing they self, you know? And they say what? They say these non-Jewish people could be a subject of interesting speculation, showing that it's not a fact. You know what I'm saying? It's a fact that they are non-Jewish people, though. You know what I'm saying? But for them to be, you know what I'm saying, saying that they are the Jews, that's all speculation. That's a lie, though. That's deception. They use it to strategize, strategize against society. You know? Say, we shall, however, confine ourselves to the remark of this official conversation and defiance of Christian proselytizing by the Byzantine, the Muslim influence from the East, and in spite of the political pressure of these two powers the, to a religion which had no support from any political power, but has prosecuted, but was persecuted by nearly all. See, so they was being persecuted Cuted by nearly all the people. The people knew that they wasn't the Jew, right? By nearly all has come, has come as a surprise, right? To all hysterians concerned with Khazars and cannot be considered as accident, accidental, but must be regarded as a sign of a independent policy pursued by that kingdom. So it's showing you that it was pursued by that kingdom, that Jewish state, you know what I'm saying? It was pursued, you know, it was not accidental. They did this on purpose to deceive, to strategize against society, right? Which leaves us only slightly more bewildered than before, yet whereas the source differ in minor detail, the major facts are beyond dispute. What is in dispute is the fact of the Jewish Khazars after the destruction of their empire. The destruction of their empire in the 12th or 13th century. On this problem, the source are, are scandals, but various late medieval Khazar settlements are mentioned in the Crimea and in the Ukraine, in Hungary, Poland, and Lithuania. The general picture that emerges from these fragmentary pieces of information is that a migration of the Khazar tribes and communities into those regions of Eastern Europe, mainly Russia and Poland, where at the dawn of the modern age, the greatest concentration of Jews are found, were found. This has led several historians to conjecture that the substantial part and perhaps the major, the majority of Eastern Jews and hence a world jewelry might be Khazar. See? So they showing you that these so-called Jews today is Khazars, right? And not what? Semitic origin. So they not the origin of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They not the original people. They took over this land and they did it to strategize against society, right? Because they not the Semitic people, not Semitic origin. He said, hence of the world jewelry might be of Khazar. See, so it's these Khazar people and not of Semitic origin. Look, the far-reaching implications of this hypothesis, hypothesis may explain the great caution exercised by historians in approaching the subject if they do not avoid it altogether. See, it's showing you that they're going to avoid this subject altogether because they don't want you to know the truth. Check this out, say, Thus, in 1973 edition of the Encyclopedia Judea, the article Khazars is signed by Dunlap, but there is a separate section dealing with the Khazar Jews after the fall of the kingdom, right? Signed by the editors and written by, uh, by the obvious intent to avoid 
upsetting believers in the dogma of the chosen race. See, so who is the chosen race? Huh? I ask, who is the chosen race? Yeah, we are the chosen race, the Hebrew Israelites, right? The slaves, right? We under the curses. So this is why they avoid this topic altogether. You know, because they don't want you to know you that chosen race. Right? See, this is not the chosen race. Look, the Turkish speaking Karaites, a fundamentalist Jew seat of the Kremlin Poland and elsewhere have affirmed a connection with the Khazars, which is perhaps confirmed by evidence from folklore and anthropology as well as language. This there seems to be a considerable amount of evidence attested to the continued presence in Europe of the descendants of Khazars. See one of the things they try to say, right? They try to say that these people from the Caucasus is coming from the tents of uh the tents of Shem, Japheth. They say they're the sons of Japheth, right? Uh, and they was in the tents of Shem, meaning the son, they the seed of Japheth seed, right? And they're saying that they see it's mixed with Shem seed, which make them Jews. That's that's what they trying to say. Right? Which is false. Right? The Caucasus sons of Japheth in the tents of Shem, one of the most racial propounders of the hypothesis concerning the Khazar origins of Jewry, is a professional of professor of medieval Jewish history at Tel Aviv University. Look, his book, Khazaria, in Hebrew, published 1944 and Tel Aviv, a second edition in 1951. In his introduction, he, introduction, he writes, the facts demand a new approach both to the problem of relations between the Khazar Jewry and the other Jewish communities. See, so he's saying it's two Jewish communities now, right? Like, what Judah and them was bringing out in the presentation the other day, showing you that it was two, you know what I'm saying, uh, people saying that they was Jews in the kingdom, right? But it's, it was the original Jews, who was the Israelites, and then pretty much the Romans who came in and took over that land, right? They The, the Romans was the ones empowered that Edomites was in power, you know, uh, over that land at this time. And these people right here would be the Khazars that came and took power, you know, and we just read about it in the book of the Khazars, showing you that they exposing themselves. So this kind of go right along with what they were seeing in the presentation, right? And these Khazars, you know what I'm saying? They made themselves, you know, Pharisees and stuff. And freaking, uh, that's when you can see when Paul brought that Christianity and he came trying to, uh, he, he was fighting against the Jerusalem church. And this, we, we gonna show the destruction of the Jerusalem church, right? But these are the caucus people right here from the caucus mountains, right? And it was these people from the Caucasus Mountains, right? The Caucasus Mountains, right? They migrated to the Americas. But these people right here, they stayed. These are the people that stayed in Israel. And these are the people today, they constitute a large majority of the world. Jewelry, you know what I'm saying? They claim to be the Jews, still. No one is us. See this right here? 
This was written before the Jewish Holocaust, right? Now, this is the real Jew Holocaust right here. All right, it says, this was written before the full extent of the Holocaust was known, but does not alter the fact that the large majority of surviving Jews in the world is of Eastern European, hold on, see, of Eastern European and thus perhaps mainly of Khazar origin. So these are the people that's of Khazar origin right here, the fake Jews, right? Now I say, if so, this would mean that their ancestor came not from Jordan, but from Volga, not from Canaan, but from the Caucasus. Ha <laughs> ha, see? Right here, this way from the Caucasus. Once believed to be the cradle of the Aryan race, right? See? So this right here would be the Aryan race, right? That what Hitler was of the Aryan people. Hitler wanted to be, wanted to develop an Aryan racial state to dominate Europe and possibly the world. See, the Aryan people right here. Same, Edomites. A Aryan race and that gen genetically, they could be more closely related to a Hun, Uger, or Mike Magda tribes than to the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? But check this out. See, here go the, the Mike Magda tribes right here. See, Hungarian people, right? Here go the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? It says, it says, should this be the case, should this turn out to be the case, then the term anti-Semitic will become void of meaning based on misprehension. Misapprehension shared by both the killers and their victims. The story of the Khazar Empire as it slowly emerges from past, begins to look like the most cruel hoax which history has ever perpetrated. See, because it's all a hoax. These are not the people, you know what I'm saying? That's what they hear. This is exactly what they is. They fake Jews because they're not us, you know what I'm saying? It's a hoax, you know what I'm saying, that they perpetrated, you know? And check this out right here, say, Attila was after all merely the king of the kingdom of tents. His state passed away, whereas the city of Constantinople remained in power. Right? All right, and this would be like Constantinople right here, which stayed in power. Say the tents vanished and towns remain. The Hun state was a whirlwind. The, a 19th century or oralist implying that the Khazars shared for similar reasons a similar fate. Yet the Hun presence on the European scene lasted merely 80 years. When the Huns first started to move westward from the steeps north of Caspian to the death of Attila in 453, whereas the kingdom of the Carthage held its own for the past best part of four centuries. They too live chiefly in tents, but they also had large urban settlements and were in the process of transformation from a tribe of nomadic warriors. So they was transforming from a tribe of nomadic warriors into a nation of farmers. See, into a nation of farmers, cattle breeders, fishermen, vine growers, traders, and skilled craftsmen. See, so they adopted 
our things that we did, right? And this hun right here said hun was a girl when it was told, it got told up, you know? The uh, foundation sunk in the ground of built houses in circular shape because they all stayed in Arab towns. Muslims called the Arab terror of the Khazar raids. That's what they called it because the Arabs were staying in their towns and in their uh, uh, fields. But Khazars ruled the tribes of the north. But you see that they transform right themselves into a tribe from a tribe of freaking warriors to a tribe of like farmers. Shalak, the tribe of farmers, cattle breeders, fishermen, vine growers, traders, and skilled craftsmen. So they transformed themselves, right? But check it out, say. Until the ninth century, the Khazars had no rival to their supremacy in the religious north, Shalak, to their su supremacy in the regions north of the Black Sea and the adjoining state and forest regions of Danapur. The Khazars were the supreme masters of the south half of Eastern Europe for a century and a half and presented a mighty bulwark blocking the euro caspian gateway from Asia into Europe during this whole period they held back on the onslaught of nomadic tribes from the east taking a bird's eye view of the history of the great nomadic emperors of the East. The Khazar kingdom occupies an intermediary position in time, size, and degree of civilization between the Han and Avar empires, which preceded and the Mongol empire that succeeded it, right? See, it says, but who was these remarkable? Remarkable people, remarkable as uh, as much by their power and achievement as by their convert conversion to a religion of outcasts. The descriptions that have come out to us or originate in hostile sources and cannot be taken at face value as to the Khazars. And Arab Chronicle 11 writes, they are to the north of the inhabited earth towards the seventh clime, having over their heads the constellation of the plot. Their land is cold and wet, right? They, and here go their land, right? Cold and wet. But notice it said, that they was a religion of outcasts and their land is cold, is cold and wet, right? The the Khazars, their complexion, hold on, check it out. Their complexion is white, blue eye, red hair. Nature is cold, right? Their hair flowing, prim and pr predom predominantly reddish, their bodies large and their and and their cold natures. Their general aspect is wild. After a century of welfare warfare, right, the uh Arab writer obviously had no great sympathy for the Khazars, nor had Nor had George George can't see that word. Armenian scribes whose countries of a much older culture had been reportedly devastated by the Khazar horsemen, right? It says 
a Jejuan Chronicle echoing an ancient tradition identifies them with the host of Gog and Magog, wild men with hideous faces and the manners of wild beasts, eaters of blood, right? They talk about these Khazar people, eaters of blood, wild man, right? They identify with Gog and Magog, right? The Amarian writer refers to the horrible multitude of Khazars with insolent, broad, lash faces and long falling hair like women. Lastly, the Arab geographer, one of the main Arab sources, has to say, Khazars do not resemble Turks. Right? Here go Khazars right here. Here go the Turks right here. Say, Khazars do not resemble Turks. They are black hair. Hold on. They got black hair too. But hold on. They say, they are black hair and are and are of two kinds. One called the Kara Khazar, right? Which would be him right here. No, 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 no. The Kara Khazar. And that would be black Khazars, right? Hold on. Like, dude, black Khazars who are swarm swarmly verging on deep black as if they were a kind of Indian, see? So, if, if you look like this, they called you an Indian, right? All right. And a white kind, Ak Khazar, right? And they say that they are extremely handsome. Craziness. This is more flattering, but only adds to the confusion, for it has customarily among Turkish peoples So they was customarily among these Turkish people, right? Referred to the ruling class or clans as white, to the Lord's strategies as black. Hold on. So the, the white Khazars was looked up as like a high class, but see, they was the low class, the black ones. Thus, there is no reason to believe that the white bulgers, right? Look at say that the Ephelites who invaded India and Persia in the fifth and sixth centuries were a fiery skin than the other Han tribes which invaded Europe. Right? It's a black skinned Khazars. Much else in his and his colleagues writing were based on hearsay and legend. And we are and we are none the wiser regarding the Khazars physical appearance or their ethnic origins. The last question can only be answered in a vague in general way, but it is equally frustrating to inquire into the origins of the Huns, Allens, Avars, Bulgars, Magyars, Bishkars, Pertus, Sabres, Ugars, Sergars, Onagars, Utigars, Tycuta, Kutrigers, Tanikes, Kotragers, Kabars, Zabenders, Pekanegs, Guts, Kumans, Kipcocks, and dozens of the other tribes or people who at one time or another in the lifetime of the Khazar kingdom passed through the turn styles of those migrate migratory playgrounds. Even the Huns whom we know much more of a uncertain origin 
Their name is apparently derived from the indiscriminate way to nomadic horrors of all kinds, including white huns mentioned above the Sabres, Migers, and the Khazars, school children who taught to look up their look up to their glorious hun forefathers. Hold on. So they saying that these are their forefathers right here, the Hun people. So, right? Remember they say Khazars don't resemble Turks. The tribes were the Turks. The Turkey language, the Turkey's language group. Right? Uh, they say their origins come from Chinese Hun. Chinese drove Hun neighbors west in a in the first century AD. The Hun Khazar were a Turk a Turkic people descendants of Bulgars, right? So they saying that there was a Turkish people, these people pretty much. Turks. Look, it's it's mentioned the Khazars in a list of people who inhabited the region of the Caucasus, though. See? So they still, they come from here. Check it out. Say, this is accepted right here by these cats. Say, Khazars as distinct from the Black Kara Khazars, the Black Kara Khazars, The Akazin, the Akazars, are also mentioned as a nation of warriors by Jor by Jordines, the great Goth historian a century later, and the so-called geographer of Ravana express identifies them with the Khazars. This is accepted by most modern authorities. See, so it's accepted by most modern authorities. See there. Uh, the Byzantine Emperor Prescus tells us try to win his warrior race over his side but the greedy Khazar chi chief named Karada considered the bribe offered to him adequate and subsided and sided with the Huns Attila defeated Karad Karada rival chiefs installed him as the sole ruler of the Akazars and invited him to visit his court. Right? Checked out check out what it say right here. Check this out. It say Uh, Karada thank him profuse, profusely and for the invitation and went on to say it would be too hard for a mortal man to look into the face of God see so they saying it's too hard for a mortal man to look into the face of God for as one cannot stare into the sun's disc even less could one look into the face of the oldest God without suffering injury, right? So this is what they told Attila. Attila must have been pleased for he conferred Kardak in this in his rule. Prestige Pris, Chronicle confirms that the Khazar appeared on the European scene about the middle of the 5th century as a people under Hunnish ser serenity and may be regarded together with the Magyars and other tribes as a later offspring of Attila's horde. See, so they wasn't these people, they just joined them. They wasn't Hagarines, right? 
they just joined them in the war, right? The tribes of the Sabines, Seragars, Batagars, no longer mentioned, observed by the Khazar tribes, Turkish Empire, a confederate of tribes, right? But check, I say, Cardiac said, you cannot look into the oldest God without facing the eyes of the oldest God without facing injury, right? So, it's, it's like telling us they know who the oldest God is, but they just choose not to worship him. They choose to worship idols. You know what I'm saying? And bring in false religions because they demons. Simple as that, they a beast. In the 6th century, they became dominant force in the Caucasus, a nation split in two. You know? Hun, the head much, Hun had much confusion. Uh, King Kershaw, Kusraw, had three golden thrones in his palace, right? And that was the uh, Persian king, right? Three golden thrones in his palace. Preserved for emperors of Byzantine, China, and of the Khazars. No state visits from these potentates materialized and a golden throne if they existed must have been, must have served a pure symbolic purpose but whether fact or legend the stories fit and well with Emperor Constantine officials account of the golden tribe seal assigned by Emperor Chen Xi to the ruler of the Khazars. Right? It, uh, it showed Khazar and Roman joined forces after this. Uh, and then, I'm going to go right here and check this out. Uh, the daughter of Heracles by the by his first wife, the promise to give her to marriage to a Turk indicates one more the high value set by the Byzantine court on the Khazar alliance. However, the marriage came to a knot because Zabel died while Eudicia and her suet on the way to him. Well, and while you do see and her suit on her way to him, they, there is also a imprevalent reference and to the effect that Zeal presented his uh, presented his son, a heartless boy, to an emperor. There is another picture that passes in. in Armenian article quoting the next text of what might be called an order of mobilization issued by the Khazar rule for the second campaign against Persia. And the Khazars were minority, but the Persians, they never recovered. The Muslims con conquered Persia, Khazar Empire, from the north conquered the Muslims and the Muslims got, hold on. It's a, a triangular power replace and replace the previous one, the Islamic Caliphate, Christian Byzantine and the newly emerged because our empire of the north. See, they merged together, see there? 
it fell to the latter to bear the blunt brunt of the Arab attack in its initial stages to protect to protect the plains of Eastern Europe from the invaders. In the first 20, 20 years of the Arab attack in the Shalak, in the first 20 years of her career, Muhammad's flight in the Medina in 622, with which the Arab calendar starts, the Muslim had conquered Persia, Syria, Mesopotamia, Egypt, and surrounded the Byzantine heartland the present-day Turkey and deadly semicircle with extended from the Mediterranean to the Caucasus and the southern shores of Caspian. Several invasions and laid siege Constantine Nople. There were attacks their main attacks were now army at Byzantine. Yeah, but it's showing you that they joined forces with Caesar and the Romans, right? And uh, they presented Zebil with ornaments. Uh, and then, uh, I guess, the daughter of Heracus, by his first wife, he promised to give her a marriage to a Turk. In the case, once more, the high value set by the Byzantine court on the alliance, on the Khazar alliance. But Zebio died while Eudilsa and her suit were on their way to him. Uh, uh, Zebio presented his son, heartless boy, to the emperor. Uh, quoting the text might be called in order of mobilization issued by the Khazar ruler for the second campaign. The Khazars were minority. I just went through that. The Persians, they never recovered. Uh, where we at? 4,000 Arabs were, were killed in these wars, right? Check this out. In fact, sources, in fact, Arab sources through the 10,000 men, uh, Shalak. In fact, Arab sources though they offer exaggerate speech of armies of a million, even of three million men engaged on either side, properly outnumbering the armies which decided the fate of the Western world at the battles, Battle of Taurus. By the same time, the death-defying phantasm which characterized these wars is illustrated by episodes as, such as the suicide by fire of a whole Khazar town as an alternate alternative to surrender. Uh, poisoning, poisoning the water supply of Babel Awad by the Arab general or by the traditional absorption would hate the route of the the defeat, defeated Arab army and make it to fight to the last man. And like that's the same they, they did to Israel when they was going against Jerusalem. You know what I'm saying? They, they, they was poisoning the waters. They encamped by the food supply and the water so we couldn't get to it without that fight. Right? Uh, check this out. To the guards, Muslims, not to the fire. 
the joys of paradise being assured to every Muslim soldier killed in the holy war, right? Say at one stage during these 15 years of fighting, the Khazars overran Georgia and Armenia inflicted a total defeat on Arab army in battle of RW AD 730 and advanced as far as Mosul and Dibakar more than a half to Damascus, capital of Caf Caliphate. But a freshly raised Muslim army stemmed the tide and the Khazars retreated homeward across the mountains. The next year, Malashma, most far Arab general of his town who had formerly commanded the siege of, the, of Cal Constantinople, took Balanjar and even got as far as Samander, another large Khazar town farther north. But once more, the inv invaders were able to establish a permanent garrison and once more there, forced to retreat across to the Caucasus. As I relief experienced in Roman Empire assumed a tangible form through another dynastic alliance when the heir of the throne was married to a Khazar princess whose son was a Byzantine known as Leo the Khazar, right? And here you go, Leo the Khazar right here, right? It says the Kegan or Kagan was forced to ask for terms. Mar went in accordance with the routine followed by other followed in other conquered countries. Request the Kagan conversation to true to the true faith. Kagan accompanied Kagan complied with the conversation to Islam must have been an act of act of Judaism. Hold on. Judaism as the state religion took place took place a few years later. Probably date for the conver conversion is around AD 740. Context with the results achieved. Mara bid farewell to Khazaria and marched his army back to Trancos Corsia, without leaving any garrison, governor, or administrator behind. On the contrary, a short time later, he requests terms for another alliance with the Khazars against the re rebellious tribes of the south. See? Khaz Khazar, Byzantine, Bulwark, European of East, outflanked by Arabs. Check this out. The main contribution of the Khazars to world history was their success in holding the line of the Caucasus against the North onslaught of the Arabs. Mara was not only the last Arab general to attack the Khazars, he also he was also the last caliphate caliph to pursue an expansion expansion policy devoted at least in theory to the idea of making Islam Trump over all the world. See so they tried to make Islam Trump over all the world. And as you can see that the Khazars was with the Christianity. Right? And as you go over in the book, they get to talking about emperors with like cut off noses and stuff like check this out, say Greek language, criminal law. Check this out. 
the arpitation of his nose. Perhaps his tongue was perfectly performed. Hold on. After 10 years of inter intolerable misrule, there was a revolution and a new emperor, Leon Leonidas, ordered Justinus Millet Mute Mute Mutilation and banishment. But check this out. All right, see, this is the Justin Romanitus, right? He cut off his nose, right? The amputation of his nose, but perhaps of his tongue, was perfect. Perform the happy flexibility of the Greek language could impose the name of Romanitus. Cut off nose, and the Molotov tyrant was banished to Krim Terry and lonely settlement where corn, wine, and oil were imported as foreign luxuries. The treatment meted out of Justin was actually regarded as an act of leniency. The general tendency of a period was humanized in the criminal law by substituting mutilation for capital punishment, amputation of hand for thefts or nose fornication being the most frequent form Byzantine rulers were also given to the practice of blinding dangerous rivals and malicious spirit Mac, at, while magnanimously sparing their lives during his exile of Charleston, Justin kept plotting to regain his throne. After three years, he saw chances improving when back in Byzantine lineage was dethroned and also has had his nose cut off. Justin escaped from Charleston to Khazar ruled town of Doris in the Krim and had a meeting with the Kagan of the Khazars, King Bazar of Bazar, and Kagan must have welcomed the opportunity of putting his fingers into the rich pie of Byzantine dynasty policies, for he formed an alliance with Justin, gave him and his sister into marriage. His sister, who was baptized by the name of Theodora and later duly crowned, seems to have been the only decent person in the scricks of sordid intrigues to bear genuine love for her noseless husband who has who who was still on his early still only in his early thirty thirties. The couple and their band of followers were now moved to the town of Phenagoria, the present Timan. So it's showing you the dude who had his nose cut off and he still ruled after being a deceiver with, a, with the Khazarians. You know what I'm saying? Justin, he reminded us, he formed an alliance with him and they gave him, they, they, they sister as, as, as a wife, right? That's how, and they, and they put him back on the throne. You know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, Theodora, Theodora, right? And check this out, right here. 
uh, but the envoys of the empire Tibet, Tobias the third persuaded Buzura to change his mind by offering him rich reward and go if he if he delivered just and dead or alive to the Byzantines King Basura Korn would accordingly gave orders to orders to two of his henchmen named Papatus and Bulger just to assassinate his brother-in-law but faithful Theodora, Theodora got wind of the plot and won her husband Justin invited Papatus and Belagret separately to his quarters and strangled each in turn with a cord. Then he took ship, sailed across the Black Sea into the Dunapi Insuri and made a new alliance with a powerful Bulgar tribe. Their king Tibullus proved for a tomb being time being more reliable than the Khazar Kagan for in seven oh 704 he provided Justin with 15,000 horsemen and attack 15,000 horsemen to attack Constantinople. The Byzantines had after 10 years either forgotten the dark side of Justin, Justin's former rule or else found their present ruler even more intolerable for they probably rose against the bias and reinstatement of Justin on the throne. And Bulgar King was rewarded with a heap of gold coins, which he measured with a Siberian whip, and went home only to get involved in a new war against Byzantine a few years later. Justin II reigned 704 through 711, proved even worse than he was first. He considered the axe, the cord, and the rat as only instruments of royalty. He became mentally unbalanced, obsessed, and hated against the inhabitants of Karas. Karasin. Right? But yeah, I just want to uh, bring some of it out today. You know what I'm saying? We're going to get... Shut up. We're going to dig back into it, though, you know, and we're going to bring some more of this uh, book out you know what I'm saying? It's the 13th tribe Co -Esler, by Co Esler, Arthur Co Esler. You know, it's a real good book with them exposing themselves and all the wicked acts that they perform. Uh, these blood sucking, bloodthirsty Khazarian people, you know, uh, who are like liars, deceivers. And, uh, you know what I'm saying? It clearly shows you how they came and you know what I'm saying what the war with the Jewish state and how they took over power you know what I'm saying and they worked their way you know what I'm saying and to taking over you know what I'm saying our our whole heritage you know our, our land mass and and our name you know but before we leave about it here we're gonna hit a tour verse right quick all right we're in Psalms 83 all right, a psalm, a psalm of Isaph. Oh God, do not hold yourself silent. Be not deaf, be not still, O oh God, for behold, your foes are in uproar, and those who hate you have raised up their head. Against your people, they plot deviously. They take counsel against those sheltered by you. They say, come let us cut them off from being a nationhood. So Israel's name will no will will no will not be remembered any longer. For they take counsel together anonymously. They strike a covenant against you. See there? So one more time, we're gonna hit, it, you know what I'm saying, before we get out of here. One more time, Psalm 83. Say, O Yahweh, O Elohim, do not hold yourself silent. Be not deaf, be not still, O Elohim. For behold, your foes are in uproar, and those who hate you 
have raised up their head against your people, Israel. They plot deviously. They take counsel against those sheltered by you. They say, come, let us cut them off from being a nationhood. Right? So that the name of Israel will not will not be remembered any longer. For they take counsel together anonymously and they strike a covenant against you. They strike a covenant against you, Israel. You know? And with this, I just, you know, want to say, uh, Kao Halalai, Yahweh Kai. You know, all praise to the Most High for the knowledge that he steady bringing out, you know. Shalom to the knights, you know. Uh, and shalom.